We'll have our second keynote speaker, Mark Boyd, who is an analyst and CEO of Platformable, uh, being there in the industry for a long time and having followed a lot of evolutions. Hello, Mark. How are you? Hi, Mary. Good to, meet you. Good to be here with you. Yeah, good to meet you. You have a great smile. I think it's because of API Days conferences. Absolutely. And we're glad, <laughs> and we're glad to have you for um, you know being the, the the second opening keynote speaker. You write. I think you 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 write. You wrote like for six for the last six years the state of banking APIs, um, the market landscape, and it, it seems you have something for us today about 2021. Absolutely. So we'll have a look at the data that we've got for this financial year, um, and we'll get straight into it. Then I'll share my screen. Let's do it. How's that? Enjoy. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, and I always make the joke. I made the joke last year that uh, I'd hate to be the um, follow-up speaker to Simon's awesome keynote start, and I realise it's going to be me. Um, okay, cool. So uh, my name's Mark Boyd. I'm the director of Platformable. I use the pronouns he and him. And today I'll be talking about open banking, open finance, the state of the market. Uh, this is a team effort, so I'd like to thank everyone at Platformable for helping me um, do this analysis, uh, run the numbers, prepare the slides, also, if you'd like to join our team, we're actually hiring at the moment. So contact me, mark at platformable.com. Uh, we've got two open positions. One will, where we'll be taking the open banking model and applying it to open health, if that's your bag, and then another role around technology policy. So get in touch. Okay, our mission at Platformable is we support open, open ecosystems and measure the value that's being generated and the opportunities for everyone to participate and co-create their own value. We tend to work in areas, in sectors where there's complex problems, often regulated industries, so banking, uh, healthcare, digital government, and we're moving into the sustainability field later this year. Um, so we build tools, we measure the value that's being generated. Um, and in regards to open banking, looking at, we've got a specific model about how we measure the value that is generated. So one thing I love about um, API Days conferences is that there's always a really good theme for it. I loved um, APIs all the way down uh, last uh, for interface and this one regulated industries because what we're talking about with open banking and open finance is it doesn't work the same as an individual company deciding to build its own platform and an ecosystem around that platform. Go for it if that's if that's your um, you know your position in the business. With open banking and open finance, and we'll see this, we'll hear about this with healthcare as well um, over the next two days. Um, that all citizens, uh, all residents of any country should be able to uh, access these digital um, uh, uh, systems. So therefore, we need them to be able to be uh, working for everyone. And so with open banking, one of the prime uh, roles that open banking had in the first place was because it was noticing that banking had this oligopoly sort of approach where banks didn't need to innovate, they didn't need to really provide customers with what the customers needed because they had the market, there was a set number of players, they were delivering the financial system. And they weren't really about enabling financial health of their customers. They were about generating fees and paying their CEOs large amounts of money and then being able to just maintain their market share position. Then we saw fintech come into the market and like I maybe mentioned TransferWise, and they're a great example as far as like looking at the need to disrupt the market because banks were charging, were overcharging for international transfer payments and TransferWise realised there was an opportunity to provide a great digital service um, at, viably with, with, you know, with um, a, a commercial opportunity but without charging those ridiculous fees. And in fact, when we've talked to banks about open banking and open finance opportunity, some banks know that TransferWise is doing that and they're like, no, 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 it's all right. We're going to just keep with our system until we've run that um, to the ground because we know the customers will keep paying because it's easier for them to just do their transfer with us. So, you know, like, so um, globally, we have seen, as you can see here on the bottom left-hand corner, 
the governments and regulators then came in and said, no, no, we want banking and finance services to be opened up. So they imposed sort of open banking regulations. That hasn't happened in every market. I'll describe other um, approaches to, towards this in a minute. But then out of that, banks then have built the APIs and then following through on this value um, chain, then, you know, standards bodies help with the banks make sure that the um, APIs are built to a common set of standards and that enables then fintech and other consumers to be able to build consistently and at scale with the bank APIs. The value of the APIs is mediated by the developer experience of the APIs and by the security um, levels because if you don't have a secure system, people aren't going to trust open banking and open finance. Um, and so, and so, they, so you won't get that adoption that you're looking for. And without the developer experience, it's just too difficult for the fintechs to scale and build um, products and services. And then out of that, you've then see see here in the green in the middle. There's the fintech aggregators, marketplaces building with the bank APIs, and then that creates value for the end users. So there's new products and services, new opportunities to build your financial health, a broader range. Of, of products and coming back to the regulators, one of the whole issues of, uh, one of the whole drivers of bringing in open banking was the fact that um, the governments wanted to see more competition in the market, break down that oligopoly um, approach that banks had sort of um, generated and had gotten to. So the, so, and then out of that, then you've got the whole range of end users who are then gonna be able to benefit from these new um, FinTech um, services and products that are being built. And here you've also got the underserved or the underbanked who hopefully have greater access to finances in all of this system. Then there's also some indirect beneficiaries that come from this sort of um, open ecosystem. So society benefits because you can do things with less bureaucracy, it's faster, you, you understand your choices much better. Um, so there's some, you know, uh, wheels being, um, uh, the cogs in the wheels uh, running a bit more smoothly. The local economies benefit because things like fintech are generating local jobs as well as being able to contribute taxes. Um, and then you've got the environmental benefits because a digital ecosystem ideally should be optimising resource use, but then also this sort of system should be able to help us move more faster towards um, things like carbon accounting and so on. Okay, but so if that's the sort of model that we should have, is it really generating the value? We've already heard from Simon talking about what sort of business models and API pricing structures the banks should be able to use to be able to benefit from an open banking ecosystem. Are FinTech able to build successful businesses? Are the underbanked able to gain access to financial services? Are end users increasing their financial health? And are there um, what flow on benefits for society, the economy and the environment? So we're going to look at some of the data as at 2021 and whether that's happening. Also, this is the launch. We've got a quarterly trends report that we come out, uh, that we uh, produce, and we're launching that today. So if you go to platformable.com, you can get a, a um, the full slide deck of all of the um, trends report for Q2 that we'll be walking you through. Okay, so open banking still growing phenomenally. Our latest uh, data, so showing from last year, Q2 2020 to Q2 2021, 490% annual growth rate. Um, so still, you know, Europe and Scandinavia out, is really the big one because of PSD2, um, UK there, um, Asia Pacific growing as well. You can see here the, um, uh, the yellow lines is the platforms and then the purple um, half circles is the products that are being made available. Um, and if we look at who's doing the best on the country level, we've got a scoring me methodology where we look at which, which countries are doing the best in terms of their regulatory environment, the bank adoption, number of fintech that are working, whether the developer experience is being, good, uh, is being um, uh, useful, um, and then, you know, are there, the, are there opportunities for consumers and the underserved to use products? So we've got a methodology, I can, we, you can, uh, we can walk you through exactly what our scoring methodology is. But in the, any case, Luxembourg comes out the best in our scores, UK following that um, with Singapore and UK being the only non-Europeans in the top 10. 
And the, here you can see our top 20, if you like. And again, it's Europe that's dominating there as far as having the sort of right environment for open banking. Uh, when we look at the growth of platforms and how that's emerged, like uh, Mehdi was saying, we've been doing this for now six years. Um, and But this data, just for ease, we've just gone back to 2019, which was when the uh, PSD2 actually came into place in Europe and was a requirement then for banks to be able to um, launch their uh, APIs. And, and you can see here the yellow line, that's, um, uh, that's Europe and then the rest there being in the other colours in the bottom corner. So even though the, you see them quite small, so Asia Pacific is the next largest at 141, but when you look by products, a, uh, Asia Pacific products actually comes up quite a good deal. And that's really because uh, I believe it's because of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which had a really detailed breakdown of all of the API banking API functionality that there should be for banks in what we saw was that this you can see here up to q4 2020 what was happening was that banks then in the asia pacific region were creating those apis on a very granular level for each functionality in the start of um, this year there was some consolidation of that where they realized that there was perhaps Got, they'd gone too microservice oriented in the functionality and they started rebundling some of their um, API functionalities into like um, payments, but not necessarily like payments overall, more like all of the ones relevant to P2, P2P payments would go into one API. All of the ones that go to bill payments would go into one API. And we saw that there was some consolidation, which is why it looks like it dips there. And then with um, Australia now being another regulatory environment, um, and some other areas, then we're seeing that increase again um, in this quarter. And then when we break it down by API products by category, here we're showing the purple ones are the mandated ones. So in Europe, Brazil, uh, UK, Australia, for example, Singapore, um, there's payments, accounts in some of those jurisdictions um, are required to be opened up by banks for AP as APIs. Some regions also have bank products and ATM locations being required, like Australia, UK, and Brazil, for example. So we're seeing that those ones, of course, are going to be the largest ones. So I like to look at these gold ones as being where the innovation is happening. This is the ones where the banks have decided there's an opportunity to be able to open those APIs. So beyond just being required to, these are the ones where they're actually opening because they see a business model opportunity or they see partnerships. Um, you can see here identity is growing as one area. Trading is also going uh, growing, which I've got something to say about a bit later. Uh, okay, so going back to our model, let's look at the system enablers. So we're going to look at the standards, developer experience, security, and we'll also look at regulation because we're at a conference where the theme is regulation. So let's start with regulation. There's 63 countries that currently have open banking or open finance regulation on the table in some way. Uh, areas like Peru, uh, where else Malaysia, um, are, and Uruguay have put it on the table and then not done anything with it. And now, but other ones were such sort of seen, you know, um, Canada was red just till recently and they've started moving again. So they're under, they're in review in progress of considering what to do next. You can see a whole range of countries here um, with some activities, you know, planned for uh, for this year or in progress. And to, sh to demonstrate how active this is, you can see as at Q2, so um, at the, as at the end of June, there's a whole range of things that we're expecting to see by the end of this year. Um, pretty much globally, there's, there's a lot of action. So when we look at standards, um, standards help enable open ecosystems to grow faster and to scale wider. So here you can see when we look at all of the APIs, Berlin Group API standard is by far the most often used. Um, some countries have specific requirements. So UK, Australia, uh, Brazil's now got an open banking standard. There's a few others um, where it's required that they be um, introducing uh, an API standard and banks have to conform to that when they're building APIs. Berlin Group is an industry 
chosen standard and there's still a lot of opportunity to then um, make it bespoke to your individual banking needs. Um, so here you can see that that's by far the most. The one that's challenging or where the data doesn't quite fit is really with the financial data exchange in the US. So uh, I, the problem with our model uh, and we're not sure how else to measure this. We look at all of the bank APIs and look at what API standard they're using um, and then record that. In the US, there's actually a large number of players who are using, or who, of middleware players, who are using the financial data exchange API and for the sort of cooperative banks and the credit unions to be able to use those, um, uh, to be able to build to an API standard for more like internal uses. So that sort of like gets hidden because there's not a huge number of uh, open banking uh, platforms in the US at present. When we also look at the open API specification as like a, an opportunity to look at standards uptake and banks, um, ba banks commitment to be able to build in a way that FinTech can then scale quickly because they're able to understand how, to, how all of the banks work at once. Um, then we can see that you know Europe and Scandinavia really stand out there with being able to uh, with being built with a description that matches the Open API specification standard. Uh, the rest of the world, you know, varies from like thirty percent to uh, seventy percent or so um, around the world. So really, lots of opportunities to encourage banks to be able to build APIs in a way that's much easier for fintech to be able to understand what. Um, the API does and to be able to incorporate it to build their products and services. The, and that then is reflected also in the developer experience. In each of these uh, scores around the world, you can see on the left is the bank and in the right is the uh, is FinTech API platforms. Um, so the Stripes, the, um, uh, the, a lot of the payments providers who have APIs, and you can see pretty consistently that in most areas of the world, then the um, fintech API platforms have a have a higher uh, uh, developer experience score than the banks. So the fintech understand the opportunity of being able to open APIs and encourage developers, and whereas the banks are still still sort of struggling with being able to um, uh, devote resources to be able to support. The developers using their APIs. And then finally on the enablers front, we've got the security incidents. There's really only around 20% of um, security incidents each quarter, which are banking and finance related. Um, and here you can see for Q2, so the um, months of uh, April to June, then we've got these, you know, these were the six cases that occurred and we've listed them by OASP. There's a really great resource that comes from 42 Crunch um, that we read um, religiously each each edition. Uh, it's, it's an API security newsletter and we're really grateful to be able to mine that to be able to create this sort of data point. Uh, and also then on the security, um, OAuth 2.0 really is like becoming a, a common standard used globally by API, uh, for by bank API platforms, whereas something like security technologies, you can see it's around half of all uh, bank uh, platforms mention one of these three, you know, at least. Some might have more than one, uh, but anyway, there's still no, you know, there's, there aren't any sort of common sort of approaches to um, security technologies being adopted in open banking APIs, at least not as far as what they're actually mentioning in the documentation that we can see. Okay, so that's sort of the supply side. So that's everything that was on the map as far as like the bank's APIs, making it ready to be available for API consumers to be able to build the products and services. And here's where we can see that the regulation isn't just the only driver for enabling fintech creation. Because you can see, I, look, the UK, I think, is a standout case because they do have, under their regulation, they do have an API standard that must be built by, uh, must be used by all banks um, when building their APIs. So th that has meant that any fintech is going to be able to build for all nine banks or beyond. You know, there's now about 18 or so um, banks 
in the UK that, you, that are opening APIs. And because they're using that API standard, once you understand how one bank's um, built their APIs, you can then easily integrate all of the other banks. So, um, so that's different to Europe where it's more about um, technical standards that are sort of more like guidelines. So it's more like banks must make sure their API has this, this, this functionality or these security measures or, or this sort of technical approach. But it doesn't actually have like an API standard template that all banks have to build, by, uh, build to. So as a, as a result, you see how that actually that's pushed down the um, European banks and their opportunities to, to uh, support new fintech entering the market. Um, in the USA, um, I, I believe that this the part of this um, 163 is partly because of the um, FTX APIs, which have been adopted by um, uh, by fintech platforms as well, but also because you know it's, been a, it's a market driven environment where the market itself sees the opportunities. Um, and so they're building um, two APIs. Singapore's got some great payments APIs, uh, payments aggregators uh, as a fintech hub for the world. Um, where that's why I think we're seeing that here. And things like Mexico and Australia are up here because they do have that same as the UK. They've got like a um, banking API standard that's required for, um, for, for that all banks must adhere to and therefore fintech understand what's going on. So I think here you can say, you can see one of the messages I would hope that would get through from API days around regulated industries is it's better for um, regulators to be opinionated, not just about APIs, but about the API standard templates that should be adopted in specific industries. For, for healthcare, it should be fire, for example, in my belief, and for uh, in the banking and fintech industry, there needs to be those um, API standards templates done. Now, if we look at what's being built, then you see around 40% of products um, that are built with APIs. And when we're talking, what we, me what we measure at Platformable is all fintech, API uh, fintech that are built with either open banking APIs or with fintech APIs. So in some markets, it's not the banks that are really innovating, it's the payments providers. Um, sometimes even the telcos, but where we're seeing the sort of payments API functionalities, for example, being exposed, um, and then fintech being able to build new market services on top of those, what we see globally is that um, about 40% of, uh, of the target market is individuals and households, and then 55% being the small and medium enterprises and um, a handful for uh, self-employed and for enterprises. One measure we're playing around with is the fintech per million. So if one of one of the goals out of banking regulation is that it was going to offer up more consumer choice. So is that really happening? So we don't have a, a, a view on what should be the standard, like how many fintech per 1 million head of population there should be. Um, so we say, so, but, but we just sort of recall what there is at the moment. And so, you know, Europe, Canada, uh, Mexico, Peru, Australia, they're all sort of like one uh, fintech per 1 million people or more, up to, you know, 140 in some cases. Um, uh, and then the rest you can see there in the orange and the, um, uh, the red is under one per 1 million head of population. So, you know, it's tricky. We, our data around areas like China and India is a bit weaker um, uh, because a lot of the stuff in China, it's hard to dig into without having um, Chinese uh, language skills in our team at the moment. Um, and India, we've been addressing some of that also because of the size of the populations, then um, that sort of reduces down that sort of average score that we can see. But really, you know, like we're still, as Simon was saying earlier, we're still at the start of all of this era of open banking and open finance. The other score that we like to look at is where they were originating from versus where they're operating in. And globally, in each region, it's roughly about 60% of the fintech operating in the region are from that region. And then there's about 40% that are more global players coming in and providing services. So, um, so what that shows us 
uh, I guess that was like the firewall question that was uh, that Simon was asked as well. It wasn't. It's not really a big issue because a lot of the um, regional um, fintech players are homegrown or regional specific, working within uh, the regulatory environment. We're gonna. I think we're gonna see this change over, but it'll be you know over the next five years or so. Um, one of the concerning areas is the Middle East and Africa, where there's really a lot of value extraction that's occurring there where it's not um, local entrepreneurs and local businesses that have been uh, enabled through open banking and open finance. It's more like international players who are coming in. And the challenge with that is that then you've got a situation where all of the data and all of the understanding of how money moves in those local markets is being used by these international players who can then provide new services to meet the local uh, residents' needs. And then that extends further this um, distribute the value distribution risk there where you it's harder for uh, local startups to get, get their foot in the door because the global players have a much better understanding of the local market and the drivers of, uh, of finance than the local players can have because the, uh, the international players have the... Uh, have the data on what's happening so you know like that's a risk in the rest of the world you can see it's around you know 60 or so percent here um with the these larger circles being the um uh, sorry the smaller circles being the ones that are operating and the larger circles being the uh of being the one uh, like all of the uh, sorry, the largest circles being the ones that are operating in that area and the smaller circles being those who are originating from that uh, region so still we're still at early days yet as far as what sort of products and services are being built with open banking apis and here you can see that overall the payments field is still by far the largest also we're seeing this area of banking operations which we include the account and api aggregation services that really took off especially because in europe you do have that situation where there's not the api standardized um, approach so therefore, um, these API aggregators can come in and then offer this single API that will connect to all banks and that bank doesn't have, you know, and then the fintech has, doesn't have to worry about connecting to each individual bank and, in instead, and can instead use an API aggregation service. So the big winner from my mind so far out of open banking and open finance are these API aggregation services that have been uh, able to grow there market share and um, have influence because of being able to play that sort of middleware role. Uh, but again, still, and rec recognising or reflecting the um, uh, the regulatory and the mandatory nature of um, payments and uh, account APIs, then you can see that the payments and the financial management of the two largest. But here, you know, what we can see encouragingly is this lending area growing as well. So, you know, new opportunities for uh, financing your small business, for being able to uh, get loans. We're seeing that buy, buy now, pay later movement there, consumer credit services and all the rest. So that's sort of growing slowly. By the way, we had to actually come up with our own uh, fintech taxonomy. We've mapped it so it matches a number of other models that are out there, but there's no sort of global standard for how to describe all of the fintech services. Um, so we're happy again, if anyone's interested in understanding our taxonomy, we'd love to talk you through it and show how it aligns with some of the other uh, models that are out there. The Here you can see actually some of the more interesting ones in just even in, since the start of the year that are growing. So consumer loans here more than doubling, uh, uh, credit applications. So really that lending is the sort of new next thing that a lot of um, uh, fintech services are sort of building on top of um, AP, uh, open banking and uh, fintech APIs. Okay, so one of the things we spoke about last year when I did the keynote showing the 2020 data is we were talking about how there wasn't actually a lot of use cases. And what I was disappointed with um, last year was that a lot of the fintech that were building were sort of building these sort of generic products. The banks were just building generic APIs. So there wasn't really that whole lean startup sort of mindset of like, let's focus on 
one customer segment first. Let's focus on building out to one use case to be able to really demonstrate the potential and really go for that. This year, we've seen a shift towards this use case. One of the issues I think that we see is because of that is Rana Piris from um, uh, Singapore and Australia has spoken about how um, banks are getting the idea about APIs now because they see that it's a new opportunity for customer acquisition. When they, when, whereas before they saw uh, APIs as a threat with their customers moving to other services, now they realize that if they partner with FinTech, that will actually allow them to connect with customers who they had previously not had any interest in their, in their, in their business at all. And so now they were finding that there's this customer acquisition. So you can see some of the banks are actually diversifying their API products and then they, in, in order to try to reach that, uh, that reach out to new customers and bring these new um, uh, customer segments in. Uh, KBank in Thailand, Thailand's an interesting case because then again, they're outside of this regulatory push for an environment, um, but they're not holding back and they're sort of getting into it. They've got some bill payment, QR payment APIs, which are quite interesting. And they're looking at, you know, being able to provide their developer payment, uh, developer portal in both um, English and Vietnamese. Oh, it's so Thai. Um, so really interesting model there. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just run through some of these use cases and point out a couple of the interesting things. Um, I love what Commerce Bank is doing in Germany. They've looked at banking as a service APIs. Um, I'm really trying to push into that because it reflects also one of their strengths. They're a corporate bank that is looking at, you know, that has a lot of commercial partnerships. So they're doing things like building out prepaid um, power supplier um, payments APIs to help their um, small and medium sized customers to be able to make payments quickly. So, you know, like they're, they're matching to what their um, customer base is and building out products that are suited to that. And then they're looking at some of the larger enterprises within their field and being able to work with them to be able to provide like, you know, banking as a service sort of offerings to them. Uh, Bank Sabadell, I like what they're doing. Uh, uh, Simon talked about uh, their Mexico branch. Here, let's look at their Spanish area. What I like here is they've got their, they've identified what their main focus for their fintech is going to be. They're looking at conversational banking, so sort of chat apps, if you like, um, and some analytics and reporting and things like and identity, all of those that might go with you know chatbot type finance. Um, for embedded finance opportunities. And then they're looking at efficiency ratios. So opportunities to optimize um, the use of capital and resources for their current customers. And then what they're, what they're doing then what, that I like is they're using, they've got a business model for APIs that it's a three-pronged approach. So they've got their open APIs for the PSD2. They've got then um, a partnership set of APIs, which they then invite FinTech, who are going to be matching one of these three focus areas to work with them and they make APIs available to them. And then they've got like a merger and acquisition type approach where they um, are incubating new FinTech um, with some venture capital opportunities to be able to build out a whole new range of uh, fintech that can be building with their APIs as well. So you see this diversity in their business models moving beyond just um, uh, just the open APIs. Uh, I love KBC Belgium. What I love about them is that they've got this green energy loan. So again, they've just moved past this idea of like um, the payments API. And instead they're looking at working with, uh, I think again, Simon mentioned bicycle retailers and how uh, you could have insurance built, being built into that. This is one of those sorts of first rung, if you like. So they've got the bicycle retailers. Um, you've got the insurance um, being enabled, but also you've got loans. So um, people can, uh, so the bicycle retailer customer, when they're buying at the bank, uh, so buying the bike, then they can apply for a loan to buy the bike and also access insurance at that point of sale as well. What's interesting is that normally when banks offer a sort of um, uh, a loan type API, they offer to pay the retailer or whoever um, a commission fee for sending them a new loan customer, if you like. KBC hasn't had to do that. They've been able to say, 
if you use our APIs for your loan platform, uh, for, for um, pr providing point of sale loans, you're going to tend to increase your sales by 20%. So that's enough of a benefit for you. And then also the shift in the cost of um, integrating with that API onto that retailer. So it's, it's lower cost for them to be able to um, build those partnerships and they're not actually then even doing a revenue share model. I'd love to see if they were doing a revenue share model, but they, they've done the sums apparently and they don't need to offer that. They've also got a green energy loan, which helps support uh, homes and offices to be able to uh, to move towards more energy efficient uh, reformations. And in the same way, they don't need to offer a, um, a customer acquisition commission fee there. They've instead been able to um, bring in retailers because of the uh, of the increase at the point of sale for those merchants. Uh, I love what Brazil Banco Tapazio is doing. One of the things I love about what they're doing is that they have a marketplace which shows the fintech that are building with their APIs, which, you, which often that's quite opaque from bank platforms. They're not sharing who's part of their ecosystem that well certainly and when they do they don't click through so you're not able to sort of see who's doing um uh you can't actually get to that end supplier and what i love here about banco tapazio is that they do actually support those uh fintech to be able to grow as commercial businesses as well um and then finally i'll just speak quickly about the fabric ecosystem uh coming out of italy they're like an embedded finance type platform they work with a bank that and make the banks uh, APIs available, but they also have the whole uh, API aggregation layer. And then they've also got banking as a service and some fintech APIs available as well, as well as broader digital services APIs like uh, video on demand type services um, that, are, that are part of their suite so that it's easier for fintech to then build with the APIs that are on their platform. One of the, I'll just point out one of their fintech that's building with their with, with their APIs. Um, with the uh, uh, buy now, pay later sort of trend, there's a fintech that is actually able to offer, um, it's a crowdfunding service. So you can actually invest money in those shoppers who are doing the buy now, pay later. And as a result, um, those, those crowdsourced, uh, crowdfunding investors tend to make about 8% return on the finances that they're um, that they're um, uh, investing in that in that program, and that that's building out their embedded finance offering, and then they've got the merchants who are able to offer the point of sale. So it's a really neat sort of flow there for the value, um, and a lot of winners in in that and how that um, value is flowing. Okay, just finally, I've got a minute left, I think. So is open banking and open finance benefiting everyone? And this really comes back to that question of why we need good regulation of open banking, open finance, of insurance, and of uh, healthcare. Um, globally, we're actually seeing a reduction in financially inclusive products. So I mentioned earlier, we've got our taxonomy that we use for fintech. Out of that taxonomy, we actually then have a subset of that that's products that we believe could have a potential for increasing financial inclusion. And the worrying thing is that there's less products being built in this area. So I mentioned earlier, I'll come back to this issue of trading. So trading isn't one of those areas that we would say helps with financial inclusion. So, but a lot of open banking API um, and fintech APIs is being built for trading. So it's widening that gap. Like the sort of products that are being built with um, bank APIs aren't really addressing the underbanked and the um, uh, and the unbanked needs. So we're actually seeing this drop. It's now fifty three percent of the products that, that are being built globally um, are able to help increase financial inclusion in our in you know in our um, metric system. Um, so that's that's a worrying trend. Uh, on the so that's the negative. On the positive, we are actually seeing some increases in societal, economic, and environmental benefits. So, uh, from an economic point of view, we're seeing a large number of uh, fintech really employing a ton of workforce uh, around the world. So, there's really this uptake in like employment opportunity coming through from fintech and through open banking. From a society point of view, we are seeing we're not seeing you know the 
huge numbers of, um, uh, of female uh, funded businesses, for example. But we are look when we look at the leadership teams, we do see that there is there are women in the leadership teams in fintech. And there's globally diverse management teams as well um, uh, with uh, non-white uh, participation in, in management as well. Um, and we are seeing some areas like Indonesia is working on financial inclusion. And finally, on the environment side of things, we do see that there are new financial products that are being built that um, from the open banking and open APIs that enable greater insights into the environment. So some carbon footprint, footprint tracking. And then I love what Stripe are doing with climate and enabling like a proportion of revenue to go towards uh, carbon removal technologies. Um, so there's much more in our reports. You can download them from our website. Uh, I think I've just about used up all my time. So I'm not sure about the questions. We can always email. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Uh